Commissioners, it's July 20th, 2020, and I'm calling the work, budget workshop of the Orlando City Council to order. So the last several months have been unlike any in our city's history, and today we are having another first, a virtual budget workshop, and this year our staff are finalizing department budgets in our country and our community faces two historic events, the COVID-19 crisis and the call to end systematic racism in our country. And in some respects, those are very different issues and in other ways they're very connected, but both of these dynamics are prioritized in our budgeting and in our investments over the next year and will be in the years to come. So let's start with COVID-19. Year after year, the city provides the best core city services of any major city in Florida. We've worked incredibly hard to maintain that standard during the crisis. And in fact, some of our departments like solid waste and permitting have actually experienced increases in demand, while other departments like FPNR have had to completely reimagine how they deliver services. Our goal with this budget is to continue to deliver that level of superior service while organizing our budget in a way that allows us to remain nimble and have resources in place to respond to the economic challenges that lay ahead because of the pandemic. The bottom line is that this year's budget will allow our city to continue to deliver the services our residents depend on without the need to raise the millage rate. The next important element of the budget is how we refocus funding for the police department, how we expand our efforts to create racial equity. We've heard time and time again that the significant investments that we've made in economic development, in jobs, in housing, in education are more important than ever as we strive to make Orlando a more equitable city. Our affordable housing initiative is a really good example of why this work is important. Uh, I want you to think about this. For every dollar that we've invested in the Fannie Mae properties, it has returned more than $7 in private sector investment. So our $40 million commitment over the past five years has enabled more than a quarter billion dollars in affordable housing to become a reality and given close to 1,800 families a safe and affordable place to live. Over the last several weeks, we spent a considerable amount of time listening to our residents about what they'd like to see their city government do as we chart our path forward. In this budget, we've allocated police funds for the research and piloting of a co-responder model. The co-responder strategy is designed to de-escalate situations involving mental health issues. In the co-response program, a therapist or a mental health counselor or social worker or a treatment professional works alongside law enforcement so that a police officer and a social worker or a therapist arrive together. We're also investing in tools to enhance training for potential use of force incidents and enhance the review process for when those incidents do occur. We're investing in the well-being of our officers by expanding mental health assistance for them. And we've also secured a federal grant to add a dedicated community-oriented policing team comprised of 10 new officers who'll focus on working collaboratively with residents to solve community concerns and cultivate positive relationships. The officers will work in teams of two with each team dedicated to a specific neighborhood so that they can be regularly seen and interact with residents in those communities working during the trust, promote more community engagement, and better serve and protect the residents of these neighborhoods. The budget also renews and expands our efforts to create racial equity by making $20 million available in short and long-term funding for housing, $4 million in job training and economic development initiatives for minority and women-owned businesses. It increases the family parks and recreation budget by 14% and expands our successful PKZ program to three other neighborhoods in our city. We know PKZ works. Over the last decade, it's credited with reducing the number of juvenile arrests by 63%. Four years in a row, 100% of the high school seniors graduated and then went to college post-secondary education or the military. These investments align with our longstanding shared effort to create a city where everyone is equally valued and equally protected and has equitable access to opportunity. It's not a mission that's gonna be accomplished in a single budget. It's up to us to make sure it remains a priority day after day and year after year. And that's why this budget includes a new position of equity official within the executive offices. Commissioners, I wanna thank each one of you for your hard work over these last several months. I also wanna thank you for your passion and your commitment and unique perspectives as we saw at the last meeting 
as we work together on racial equity issues while ensuring our city can financially weather the global COVID pandemic. To our city employees, once again, thank you for your service and sacrifice as we work on behalf of the residents of the city beautiful. And with that, we'll begin the budget presentation with our CFO, Chris McClain. Chris. All right, thank you, Mayor. Good morning, Mayor. Good morning, Commissioners. I'm going to have uh, Deputy CFO Michelle McCrimmon share her screen. It's the budget workshop we're going to go through. There you go. Hope everybody can see that. Hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, we have a lot to cover this morning, so let's uh, just jump right in. Michelle, can you go to the agenda slide? Thank you. Uh, so here's what we're going to cover this morning. Um, I will uh, start off with a quick update on how the coronavirus pandemic has affected the city's finances, and I'll cover just a couple of slides on the city's current fiscal year, which is fiscal year 2020. Then Deputy CFO Michelle McCrimmon will take over and walk us through the budget process. She'll provide a quick discussion on uh, the core responsibilities of cities in Florida. We'll talk about other important governmental services and which governments are mainly responsible for those functions. Also how the city helps support those other um, important governmental functions. And then we'll get into the tentative proposed 2021 budget, primarily focused on the general fund. Uh, and then we'll hit on some of the proposed enhancements to our municipal services for next year. Uh, we'll then cover the city's enterprise funds, other major funds, and we'll talk about the capital improvement program. And then Michelle will finish with uh, next steps and the budget calendar for the remainder of the budget cycle. Uh, commissioners, I've provided some of this information to you in recent briefings, but for the public watching at home, we wanted to provide just a few comments on how the coronavirus pandemic has affected the city's finances so far. Uh, the budget office has been keeping a close eye on revenues and expenditures since the start of the pandemic, and they'll continue to monitor the situation as we go along. Um, there are lots of moving parts here, uh, and there's considerable uncertainty, especially regarding some of the city's more economically sensitive revenues. Um, but fortunately, uh, due to the city's strong financial management practices and conservative budget assumptions, we were well positioned to weather the impacts of the pandemic. Uh, we also maintain strong reserves across all of our funds, including the general fund, which have reserves at the end of the last fiscal year of about 26% of the budget. We've also benefited from the fact that our major revenue sources are not particularly sensitive to short-term economic impacts. For example, property taxes and the OUC contribution account for over 60% of the general fund budget. For our largest revenue source, which is property taxes, the vast majority of taxpayers pay their taxes in November and December in order to take advantage of discounts provided under state law. So by March, we had already received um, almost all of our property taxes for the current year. Uh, so property taxes have not been materially affected by the pandemic. Um, our second largest revenue source, which is the contribution from OUC, the Orlando Utilities Commission, um, that's a negotiated fixed payment amount, and we continue to receive the amount that we negotiated with OUC for fiscal 2020. Um, as you know, OUC is a publicly owned utility, and the net income from OUC's operations are reinvested back into the community through OUC's annual contribution to the general fund. The transfer amount for fiscal year 2020 is over $95 billion, which helps to support general fund activities and is the equivalent of almost three mills of property taxes. So it's a significant component of the general fund revenues. Um, the pandemic started to affect our local area in March, uh, which as you know, is halfway through the city's fiscal year. Our fiscal year runs from October 1st through September 30. Uh, so going into March, revenues were ahead of budget, which allowed us to absorb uh, some of the declines in certain revenues that we started to see um, in April and May. Uh, expenditures were almost on were all also on track or slightly under budget. So through a combination of uh, conservative budgeting practices, strong reserves, largely stable revenue streams, and good financial management by our operating departments, we have avoided having to do uh, mid-year furloughs, and we have been able to keep many of our temporary and seasonal employees uh, employed by reassigning them to assist with COVID-related activities. Um, some of those activities are. Um, helping out at testing sites and helping with food distribution operations. So uh, we were glad that we were able to do that. Um, we have no official hiring freeze in place, although hiring has slowed naturally as a result of the pandemic. Um, so all these things considered, we currently project to end the fiscal year in a break-even position. Um, if we're fortunate, we might have a small surplus that we could use for some one-time capital projects, uh, which is what we've typically done with uh, prior year surpluses. Um, but we certainly have to stay vigilant and continue to monitor the changing conditions. And if we need to make adjustments, we will certainly do that. 
Um, we wanted to go through uh, some of the pandemic-related expenditures that we've incurred so far uh, and talk about how we anticipate paying for those. Uh, we spent about $1.1 million so far on goods and services like personal protective equipment, cleaning and disinfecting services for city facilities, IT costs related to quickly moving some of our workforce to working from home. And we've moved to support our local nonprofit organizations focusing on homelessness and food bank operations. Next slide, Michelle. Okay. Uh, we've been tracking all of our COVID-related payroll costs, um, and there have been several. We're up to about $1.7 million, and we continue to track that and, and monitor it. Um, some of this is for employees who are out on quarantine um, over time and, and, and callback pay uh, and um, backfill pay as well. Uh, but we'll seek reimbursement for as many of these expenses as possible. Next slide. Uh, we have some financial commitments that we have made, but we haven't yet incurred. Uh, most commitments total about $1.7 million, uh, including a million-dollar contribution to the Heart of Florida United Way's Project CARE Fund, and that's for utility assistance for OUC customers. OUC has also contributed about a million and a half towards this fund, so I think there's about $2.5 million in there that's available. Um, and I'll use this as an opportunity to reiterate that utility assistance uh, is available for OUC customers who have been impacted by the pandemic and are unable to pay their bills. Um, information is available at OUC.com slash assistance, and residents can also call 211 and ask about project care. Uh, we have some outstanding purchase orders for additional PPE, personal protective equipment. Uh, we're still seeing some supply chain disruptions for these types of supplies, uh, but we continue to work on stocking up our PPE reserves so that our first responders are in a position to safely respond to the pandemic. We've also committed about $95,000 to help the Salvation Army with an isolation shelter. For any of our citizens who are experiencing homelessness that need to be isolated due to COVID, and we have uh, $65,000 remaining committed for an additional isolation shelter. Um, in terms of potential reimbursements, uh, the city's re received a few uh, grants that we will use to cover some of our pandemic-related expenses. You can see those listed on the slide here. Uh, we also intend to seek reimbursement from Orange County's uh, CARES Act funding. Orange County has received $243 million in CARES Act funding from the federal government. And in addition to providing support to individuals, families, small businesses, and social service organizations, um, the county has made available $24 million for cities in Orange County and to Orange County constitutional officers to apply for to reimburse COVID-related expenses. Um, Orange County has given us until October 30th to submit requests for reimbursement, and the county's CARES Act funding must be spent by December 30th. Um, also, the federal uh, government and the United States Congress appropriated $3 trillion in FEMA public assistance funding for pandemic-related expenditures. So we have the ability to seek reimbursement for our pandemic-related expenses from FEMA, and that should cover about 75% of eligible expenditures. So we have several potential reimbursement uh, buckets that we are looking at uh, seeking reimbursement for. Um, on the housing side, we received CARES Act HUD grant funding to prevent, prepare for, and respond to COVID-19. The city's housing department is working through the federal guidance and waiting on some additional instructions on how this funding can be used. Um, and then there's a possibility of future CARES Act funding. We'll continue to go after every opportunity to secure funding to help our community through this pandemic. Uh, this table shows some of our major general fund revenues. Uh, the first column is the fiscal year 2020, which is the current year, it's the adopted budget. The second column is our estimate for where we will end the current year uh, in September. And the third column is our estimate for next fiscal year, fiscal 2021. Uh, Michelle's going to get into some of these in a little more detail, so I'm just going to skim through these pretty quickly. Um, as we discussed earlier, for fiscal year 2020, property taxes and the OUC contribution are unaffected by the pandemic. You can see that in uh, the first and second columns uh, in the table for property taxes and the OUC uh, contribution. Um, property taxes, as you know, are driven in part by the assessed value that is set by the county property appraiser. Uh, and state law requires that properties be assessed based on market conditions as of January 1st of each year. Since the pandemic did not start to affect our local area until March, property values for 2020, the 2020 tax year, which drives our revenues for, for next year, fiscal 2021, 
those property values and assessed values are unaffected by the pandemic. So due to growth in market values uh, for existing properties and a significant amount of new construction that has come onto the tax roll this year, property tax revenues will grow by approximately 10% next year. And again, Michelle will cover this in a little more detail in a few slides. Um, we will continue to watch real estate market trends between now and January 1st of 2021 to try to determine what impacts uh, on future budget years beyond FY21 the pandemic might have on property taxes. For the OUC contribution, the city and OUC have negotiated a lower general fund contribution for next year, and that's reflecting OUC's lower anticipated net income as a result of the pandemic. OUC has seen de decreases in utility usage, especially from their major customers like Universal and the Orlando International Airport. So for next year, OUC's contribution will be about $91 million or about four and a half million lower than the current year amount. You can see that on the table as well. Uh, this next line shows the sales tax collections. Um, while the city does not have its own sales tax, we do receive a portion of the state's sales tax collections. Um, this is the most economically sensitive major general fund revenue source that the city has. Uh, our local area, as I said, began to see the effects of the pandemic in March, um, but there's a lag in the, in the timing of um, the, the taxable sales at the, at the point of sale and the time when the city receives a distribution of those sales tax revenues. So we didn't start to see the declines in sales tax revenues until May, uh, which was down 37%, and then June, which was down 51% uh, from expected numbers. Um, but with the reopening of the economy that started in May, we expect to see smaller decreases, uh, starting with revenues that the city will receive um, in just a few days and then uh, into August and September. So you can see on the chart there that we are anticipating coming in short of budget by about $5 million. And then we're budgeting uh, for next year that uh, sales tax collections will be uh, lower than fiscal 20, again, just due to the pandemic, uh, restarting the economy and, and just the uh, unpredictable nature of how quickly the economy uh, will recover. Uh, this next line on the chart shows state revenue sharing. It's it's largely driven by state sales tax collections. So everything I just said about sales tax um, pretty much applies to the state revenue sharing line as well. You'll see we are projecting a lower state revenue sharing number for fiscal year 2021. Um, we have seen minor impacts on communication services taxes, uh, but we're anticipating slightly lower collections next year. Uh, and then last on the chart is the local business taxes. That's from our business tax receipts. This revenue comes in at the beginning of the fiscal year. So for fiscal year 20, those revenues were unaffected by the pandemic. You can actually see that they were higher than the adopted budget at $9.8 million. Um, but we know that our local businesses, especially our small businesses, have been hit um, hard during this pandemic. So we unfortunately are anticipating lower local business tax revenues for next fiscal year. Uh, let's hope that's not the case, but uh, we are preparing for that uh, just in, in case we need it. Next slide, Michelle. Thanks. Uh, this slide hits on some of our larger enterprise funds. Uh, in the water reclamation fund, we've seen about a 15% reduction in flows, uh, which results in lower revenues there. Um, again, that's due to uh, less usage from um, the city's major water reclamation customers. Um, similar customers to OUC, so uh, Universal, uh, the International Airport, when those uh, uses are down, it results in lower revenues for the water reclamation fund. But the water reclamation management team continues to monitor the situation uh, and they have healthy reserves to help them uh, weather these impacts. Uh, on the stormwater management fund, uh, those revenues come in on the tax bill every year. So as I mentioned earlier, tax bills were largely paid in November, December. So the stormwater uh, fund uh, has been unaffected so far. The parking system, though, has seen a reduction in revenues due to lower activity in the downtown core. Um, parking management team has been able to adjust expenditures to offset the decline in revenues and the parking fund also fortunately has healthy reserves that have helped them weather the revenue impacts. Our venues fund has been hit pretty hard due to the pandemic. Uh, professional sports games and concerts have been canceled or postponed, and that is largely um, and that's obviously had a significant impact on revenues. Uh, the first part of fiscal year 20 was was pretty good for the venues fund. So some of these impacts can be absorbed with uh, the revenues from earlier in the year. But we do anticipate a loss for the venues fund for this fiscal year, and we'll have to manage through that. 
Uh, lastly, as you know, the county's tourist development tax collections have fallen significantly uh, due to the pandemic. Uh, and while the city does not receive any of the county's TDT revenues to support city operations, we do receive a portion of the county's TDT revenues that we are required to use to pay debt service on bonds uh, that we issued to finance the construction of the Amway Center. So we continue to monitor the recovery in the tourism industry, uh, but for now we have surplus revenues and debt service reserves that will help us make our debt service payments uh, for at least the next 12 months. Um, just a couple more slides for you on the fiscal year 2020 update. Uh, this slide shows the adopted general fund budget for fiscal 20, which was 517 million. Other funds totaled 845 million, so our all funds budget for fiscal year 20 was almost $1.4 billion. Uh, this next chart shows the history of our general fund reserves as a percentage of the general fund budget since uh, fiscal year 2003. Our reserve policy sets a range of 15 to 25%, and in almost all years on this chart, you can see that we've been at or above our maximum reserve levels. Uh, the run-up in, in reserves between fiscal 09 and fiscal 12 reflects that the dollar amount of our reserves stayed steady, while the general fund budget shrank as a result of the impacts of the Great Recession. So you'll see the percentage, the reserves as a percentage of a, a lower number of the budget, um, that percentage uh, grew um, between 2009 and 2012. Uh, but for the past six years or so, we've been back at around our maximum reserve target of 25%. And again, that has helped us uh, be in a good position to weather the impacts of the pandemic. This next slide just shows uh, that the city continues to have strong bond and credit ratings from the three major credit rating agencies. Um, you'll notice in the upper right corner, the AAA rating from Fitch, that's the highest credit rating available. So we're very proud of that. Uh, we certainly um, hope to maintain that uh, for, um, for the future. Next slide. This next slide shows uh, just a couple of the recent comments from the three main rating agencies. And we've spoken to just about all of them after the pandemic. So these are fairly recent comments uh, about the city's financial strength. Fitch says that our financial resilience remains high, notwithstanding the current period of pressure on our economy and our revenues, given our significant reserves and budgetary tools. Moody's says that our credit position is very good and that credit uh, key credit factors are our strong financial position, extensive tax base, and mid-range debt and pension burdens. And then S&P says that the outlook for the city's credit ratings reflect our very strong budgetary flexibility due in part to management's strong policies and practices. So those are some great comments from the three independent credit rating agencies. Uh, this last slide, I think this is my last slide, yep. Uh, it shows some of the budget amendments that we've done so far in fiscal year 20. Uh, at the beginning of the fiscal year, we reallocated some funding to pay for collectively bargained pay raises. We've added some, we've added four positions during the year to address the changing needs of the city and our community. We budgeted for 20 different grants that the city has received, totaling uh, $2.3 million, which is great. Uh, and we've made some adjustments to the capital improvement budgets uh, along the way. Um, so that brings us up to speed on where we are for the current fiscal year. Uh, and I'm going to turn the presentation over now to Deputy CFO Michelle McCrimmon, who's going to walk us through the fiscal year 2021 budget. Michelle? Great. Thank you, Chris. Good morning, Mayor, Commissioners, and those participating through Zoom. Before I get started, I wanted to pause and highlight uh, some information on our budget. Um, our fiscal year, uh, what we call a fiscal year, is a 12-month period, um, and that fiscal year runs October 1st to September 3rd. As Chris mentioned, most of our time uh, talking about the general fund, and that's because it's our primary operating fund where we pay for basic city services programs and our daily operations. And we have separate funds for our standalone businesses or enterprise funds. Um, so those are water reclamation, parking, venues, solid waste, where ratepayers pay the expenses. They really operate as a business-like business um, fund. And then we have other funds. Um, some of those we call special revenue funds, where we set aside dollars that come in for very specific uses. So, for example, housing grant funds. Those can only be used for housing purposes and you can't use them to fund firefighters or other city operations. So we don't co-mingle them with the general fund, we set them aside in other funds. So this is a, this workshop is, you know, really to highlight our proposed fiscal year 21 budget. Once the budget is approved, there will be a budget book um, posted online, but um, that, the, the budget book for fiscal year 20 
450 pages, has a lot of really great information, specifics about each department, services, programs, lots of other details. So I encourage anyone who wants to really take a deep dive and, and learn more about our city operations to um, access that information that's online for our fiscal year 2020 budget that will be updated for 21 once it's approved. So this is our budget cycle. We start the budget process in February with our departments, asking them to pull together um, revenue estimates. And you can see right at the start of the pandemic was right in the middle of that process for our departments where they were pulling together budgets and putting information together and really having to make adjustments within their own operations as well as continue the budget process. Uh, it continues through May where the budget office reviews and discusses that, makes recommendations in June, and we're here before you now in this budget workshop. Um, so we are in this adjustment phase right now. Um, we'll have uh, discussions with all of you commissioners, and then we'll bring together the final budget um, in September for adoption. So the city is a local government manages essential services that are nearest to our citizens, businesses, and visitors' day-to-day -day life. So that's safety, sidewalks, permits, parks, recreation, picking up garbage, um, ensuring we have clean lakes, uh, ma maintenance of our local streets, wastewater. But what about the other critical services that people need? Who provides those services and who pays for those services? So these are a few of the critical services, um, and you'll see that many of them are funded by federal and state dollars, and those are administered by local entities such as Orange County Public Schools, Orange County Department of Health, Lynx, and many others. But does that mean that our city leaders point fingers to our constituents, um, you know, that these programs aren't our responsibility and, and go talk to, to these agencies? Well, of course not. So while those critical services are outside of the core functions that are mentioned, the mayor has set priorities for the city and through all of your leadership have committed and provided resources through the years to contribute to those programs within the core areas. So during the workshop, we're going to spend most of our time, as we talked about, on the general fund. And spending on these programs is sprinkled is also sprinkled on other various funds, especially those that are grant funded. So I mentioned the special revenue funds earlier. We've got housing dollars included in there. Um, and so it can be really difficult to see how all of the collective city contributions add up to significant dollars. So what we've done is uh, the next few slides are gonna compile the city's contributions to those programs to really show you um, in total um, how impactful those are. And these are for fiscal year 2020. So for example, our contributions to education programs is over $11 million. Um, so that's through programs within our families, parks and recreation department. And many of those programs are made possible due to federal. Transportation programs total about $11 million. And that includes support to links and limo of six and a half million dollars. And then housing contributions total almost $11 million, and that includes our funding for affordable housing projects, rental assistance, um, rehab, and many of those dollars came from federal and state funding. And as the mayor mentioned earlier, many of these affordable housing dollars really help to enable impactful affordable housing projects to be completed. Social services contributions total over $10 million, uh, with the most significant being almost $4 million in contributions to community service organizations that focus on helping victims of domestic violence, homeless, seniors, and family sustainability. And we've also funded almost $2 million towards the support of minority-owned businesses and job training. Contributions within sustainability initiatives also include community gardens and urban farms that increase the supply of fresh fruits and vegetables in our neighborhoods. So many of these programs um, are grant funded, and so we budget those when they're committed. 
And so that's why we're showing these for fiscal year 2020, because our fiscal year 21 doesn't necessarily include some of these grant programs, just because um, some of those, as, as Chris mentioned before, those come through mid-year um, through city council and then ultimately through the BRC process. So as we jump into the fiscal year 21 budget, I have to just um, remind you to be mindful that this information may change between the numbers that you see today and the proposed budget in September. Um, this has been true every year, but it's, it's especially true now with um, the impacts of COVID-19 and as we uh, see some of the uh, adjustments to the revenue estimates on those um, revenues uh, over the next few weeks. So this is our fiscal year 21 all funds budget. It's just over uh, $1.4 billion. Um, and you saw on Chris's earlier slide, last year was just under 1.4 billion. So it's about a 6% increase. We will spend most of our time um, talking about the general fund, but I'll just point out to you that our largest revenue source for all funds is our charges for services. And that includes our enterprise funds, our water reclamation, solid waste, stormwater. And so related, you'll see our largest expense by department is our public works, which all of those operations um, are included in. Most of these percentages are consistent with the prior year. I'll just highlight our non-department is a little bit higher at this point in the budget process because we've got some of our capital projects that are included in here. And as we move through the budget process, those capital projects will be um, reallocated to the applicable departments that they go in. So as mentioned, we'll spend most of our time talking about the general fund budget. Um, the general funds about 40% of our all budget um, or our all fund budget. And um, as I mentioned earlier, is our primary operating fund. So our total revenues within the general fund, the proposed budget, um, it's increased $16.6 .6 million and 3.2%. And just as a basis of comparison, last year we came to you with an over $28 million uh, proposed increase in the general fund. So you can see the impact right away um, of this pandemic. And so, but for the increase in property taxes, we, we might be having a different conversation um, today. So on the next few slides, we'll dive into some more details. And I know Chris walked you through um, some of these uh, revenue categories in particular, uh, especially the OUC dividend and the sales tax and the state revenue sharing. Um, those were where we saw the most um, of the largest impact of COVID-19. So this is our chart of the property tax revenues over the last 20 years. Fiscal year 15 is where we um, have the one mil increase. And so you can see the steady increase in revenues. Um, and as the mayor stated, this budget uh, workshop proposes no change to the current millage rate. And so we will continue, as Chris mentioned, we will continue to monitor um, the impact of COVID on our fiscal year 22 property tax revenues and, and valuations um, that will play into, play into that. So property taxes are the largest single revenue source for the general fund, 45%. It's determined by the taxable value of your home, not determined by the city, but that's determined by the property appraiser's office. But we, the city, do determine the millage rate, um, and that is determined by, by you, the city council. The millage rate is $1 per $1,000 of taxable value. So with our current millage rate being 6.65, that means uh, every, for every $1,000 of taxable value is $6.55. And I'll just remind you that uh, the, the city's portion of the property tax bill is about one-third of of someone's total bill. The rest is Orange County Public Schools at about 40%, Orange County 20%, and then the remaining 10% is for the library and the St. John's River Water Management District. So 
So there's a lot of words on this slide, but essentially our assessed value increased by about 10% from last year, which is why we saw such an increase in our property tax revenue. About 40% of that increase was due to new construction. And two thirds of our parcels are at capped values, which basically limits the increase of um, the value that's taxed on, um, which was about 2.3% in 2020. So while as homeowners and business owners, those caps and exemptions um, certainly help all of us personally, there is a direct impact on funding the local governments. And so we report to you the value of those um, to the city. And so in fiscal year 21, that was about 51 million in foregone revenues to the city um, due to those, those property tax caps and exemptions. Our charges for services, um, they're fairly consistent with last year. And those are about 10.3% of our total general fund revenues. Our intergovernmental and sales and use tax. So this is um, where Chris had talked about the OUC dividend um, reduction. Um, the total dividend uh, is the total payment from OUC is reduced by 4.4 million. Um, we split that between franchise fees and dividend payment, which is why uh, you see here at the top that we've mentioned it's um, reduced by nearly $3 million. But the total um, impact for this OUC reduction is 4.4 million. And so um, in total, we've got a reduction between intergovernmental and sales tax of about 8.4 million. And there's no real significant changes in our other revenue from last year. So this is our general fund expenditures by use. Um, and we're gonna get into the details of um, the different departments um, and go through a few specifics in the next few slides. But before we jump into that, these are kind of the high level um, biggest impacts to the general fund expenditures. And um, I'll highlight one item on here and everything else when we get into the different department budgets, um, I'll mention these, but across the board for all of the departments, um, there were wage increases. And so um, about three quarters of our employees are in bargaining units. And so there are contractual obligations for wage increases um, per those bargaining agreements. If you add in the non-bargaining employees, about 90% of our employees are, you know, um, were contractually obligated through those bargaining agreements um, and, and are considered non-bargaining. So that's 90% of this um, wage increase. Also built into the wage increases, are the um, increase of the minimum wage. The mayor had um, established last year the goal of increasing the city's minimum wage to $15 an hour, and we were spreading that over three years. So this is year two of that. So a portion of this increase does include that increase of the minimum wage to $14 an hour. And this is just a uh, breakout of the general fund expenditures um, by use as a percentage of total. You'll see that the salaries and wages and benefits total 65%. So we closely manage our benefit costs and are prudent when adding any new positions, um, especially because of the fact that those are recurring costs um, once you add new positions. And most of these percentages are uh, comparable to the prior year. We've added some additional details here on the side to show what types of expenses are included in benefits. And so you'll see it's pension costs, health care, post-retirement, um, health care, workers' comp, payroll taxes. And then the other operating expense here on the side, um, those are tax increment payments. So those are the payments that go to the CRA when you have property tax payments go up your payments to the CRA will also go up for their portion of those taxes. Um, other operating also includes our debt service, 
grants and incentives, and also our contingency. And um, all of these are comparable mixes to the prior year. The largest portion of our benefit costs is healthcare. Um, and so that's about a $30 million expense to the general fund. And we always um, are very proud of the work that our HR team um, does with managing this plan because you can see on this chart, this green is the industry average health plan cost increases. And I think all of us, you know, anecdotally know folks and we've heard on the news about the stark increases in healthcare costs. And this blue are, indicates our city's premium increases. And so once again, um, for fiscal year 21, there is a very minor um, rate increase that actually only impacts about 10% of our employees. And so um, has a very minimal impact on the general fund, which we're grateful for, especially this fiscal year. And so this is the breakout of the general fund by department. And we've got um, several slides that follow that will go into the details for each department. So um, go into too much here. The only thing I will highlight is we've got a um, increases in uh, all of the areas other than non-departmental and public works, but again, we'll go into that. And this is just a further breakout of the expenditures by department and um, the non-departmental piece, um, just providing some more information about what that is. Um, and so we've got some slides later on, but essentially non-department is transfers for capital and operating support, our tax increment payments. So again, those payments to CRA, debt service contingency. And again, we'll go into some more details. So let me give you the lay of the land because um, this is the slide for economic development, but all of the following departments will be laid out the same. On the top left-hand corner are the general fund divisions um, that are included within this department. So again, this is general fund focus here. General fund employees um, that are included in the, the um, fiscal year 2020 adopted a number of employees, and then how many are recommended as a part of this fiscal year 21 budget. On the top right-hand corner, we have the general fund budget, fiscal year 20 adopted, and the 21 recommended. And then just for informational purposes, we have the all funds budget here. Down below the fiscal year 21 recommended programming, that is general fund specific. So the, the all funds budget is, again, informational but the, um, this recommended programming is, is just related to the fiscal year 21 budget. Um, and the pay increases that I mentioned before, those are across um, all departments. And so even though those may have an impact to the budget, we haven't individually mentioned them here just because it's, it isn't across the board. So for economic development, um, really from a general fund perspective, they remain fairly stable and the budget as a percentage of Total is consistent for the general fund and all funds. And we've listed the um, recommended programming uh, here for them. The most significant being the, this will be the first year of the tax rebate for KPMG for their new training um, site in Lake Nona. The executive offices, that includes the office of the mayor, community affairs, communications and neighborhood relations, city clerk's office, commissioners, city administrative officer, office of minority women in business enterprises, human resources, sustainability, city attorney's office. Um, their uh, budget from a general fund perspective was fairly stable and as a percentage of total is consistent um, for the general fund and all funds. Most significant changes that are included in their budget, uh, we have a $250,000 contingency for community nonprofit partner support. Uh, with the impacts of um, COVID-19 impacting so many of our partners in the community, we've added uh, additional contingency for support to them in anticipation of, um, of those needs. And then we've added some positions within the executive offices. We have $475,000 for a sustainability project manager. 
Spanish translator, public records specialist, labor rec records specialist, and as the mayor mentioned, an equity official. Families, Parks and Recreation, that includes the Children's Affairs, the Director's Office, Parks and Recreation. Um, the FPR from a general fund perspective um, increased as a percentage of the total general fund. So they were at 7.2% and now they're at 8%. Um, and this all funds includes um, the grant funds and their after school all stars funds. So they've got a lot of recommended programming um, within Families, Parks, and Recreation. We've got $2.1 million for the expansion of Paramore Kids Zone to three other neighborhoods, as Mayor had mentioned earlier. We've got $896,000 uh, for personnel and operating for the opening of the Lake Lorna Dune Park. We've got a little over half a million dollars for recreation field maintenance contract increases over $261,000 for personnel and operating costs for the new Rosemont Neighborhood Center gym, $250,000 for personnel and operating for the opening of the Grand Avenue Neighborhood Center, and then an additional $100,000 for athletics and recreation supplies. So you can, their um, net change in the budget is about um, just over $5 million. The fire department um, as a percentage of total is fairly consistent for both the, gen for the general fund, but is slightly lower for all funds. Uh, the most significant change in the fire department is uh, $200,000 for diversity funding. And that was a recommendation from Mayor Dyer's diversity task force. We have 300,000 for five new civilian paramedics and $150,000 for two new communications supervisors, also civilian positions. A big increase for FIRE was um, $2.4 million increase in their pension costs. Um, for housing and community development, um, from a general fund perspective, those costs were fairly stable and the budget as a percentage of total was consistent for the general fund and for the all funds. Um, the general fund piece, this is just for administrative costs um, and administrative support. The, more, the majority of the staff and programs for housing are budgeted in separate grant funds due to the strict nature of how they can be spent. And the fiscal year 21 budget only includes budget for confirmed programs. So the CARES Act funding that Chris had mentioned earlier, which totals about four and a half million, that is not included in this fiscal year 21 budget until it's programmed. And so um, that would increase the all funds budget by almost 50% once that does get adopted. The all funds budget also does not include over $200,000 in state housing funds. Um, they were originally in the budget, but as I'm sure all of you have heard, um, as of recently, that, that was cut out of the state's budget. So we did have to reduce that out of the all funds budget. Um, but as Chris mentioned in his presentation, um, hopefully there'll be some more uh, CARES Act money coming to the housing department for programming later this year. Business and financial services um, all remained fairly stable. The budget as a percentage of total um, was consistent for the general fund, slightly lower for all funds. Uh, primary impacts to programming, additional maintenance of $350,000 for our new CAD system, that's for our um, public safety. Uh, we had some lower vacancy savings um, that's gonna increase the budget. Uh, and then we had um, the two payroll clerks coming in, one from OPD, one from OFD, to, in order to centralize all of our payroll functions. And then we have a pension specialist that's being funded out of the general fund. And then there's an increase in the facility budget. The police department, we've got a few extra slides to provide some additional details on um, their budget. This first slide shows a deeper dive into 
their um, expenses by use. And you can see that salaries and benefits are about 87% for the police department. And that's compared to the general fund overall of 65%. And the Orlando Fire Department is comparable. They're about 90%. So public safety really is the, the biggest cost is people. For OPD, the next um, biggest cost within their department is fleet. And so that's uh, about $10.5 million each year. And the biggest drivers are those are almost $5 million in replacement costs, fuel of $2.6 million, and then $2 million in repairs. Uh, the replacement costs are important because um, we, each year that, um, each year we're setting aside dollars for the eventual replacement of our vehicles so that when a vehicle reaches its end of life, we're not having to take money um, and figure out and program that in. We've already been setting aside a little bit each year um, towards that, that replacement vehicle. So really the only new ask for, from a budget perspective would be if there were additional vehicles. Um, and then Beyond the fleet expenses, the next one is the um, contractual expenses. And so that's um, the radio system of about 1.4 million, vehicle leasing of about 1.3, and then janitorial services of about 600,000. So this is a detail of OPD staffing um, between the different bureaus, their administrative services bureau, which includes their recruiting, uh, their communications, training, and administration, um, their investigative services bureau, their patrol services, and their special services bureau. So the new positions that are being added within the police budget, we've got um, three positions, maybe two to three, um, for use of force investigators. We've got one administrative position that's being moved to um, centralized payroll. We have five civilian positions being added for the crime data center. Uh, there are 10 community-oriented police officers being added um, that's partially grant-funded. Um, then we have three school resource officers positions that are being added as well, or proposed to be added. The uh, OPD budget from a general fund perspective remained fairly stable as a percentage of budget and slightly lower for the all funds budget. And the difference between the general fund budget and the all funds budget is the um, airport officers at uh, GOA. And that's primarily funded by GOA. The co-responder model and expanded uh, mental health assistance budget um, that the mayor had mentioned, that's included in non-departmental, and so you'll see that in a few slides. So we've talked about most of these um, here for the additional um, janitorial co uh, contracts, the additional personnel being added. Um, just like fire, there were increases in the police pension costs, so there's a million and a half um, included in the police uh, budget for that. We have an increase of $100,000 for support to the school crossing guard fund. And we talked about those items there. So public works from a general fund perspective remain fairly stable. Um, and the budget um, for the general fund and the all funds was fairly consistent. Again, these are just the general fund divisions. So um, most of the public works operations are accounted for in funds outside of the general fund. So this includes just the director's office and then the engineering and streets divisions within public works. Transportation was fairly stable from a, a general fund perspective. Um, their budget as a part of their budget as a percentage of total was consistent for both the general fund and the 
all funds. And there were real significant changes there. On the non-departmental um, slide here, this includes our tax increment payments, so those payments to CRA, debt service, contingency, and transfers to other funds. Um, those decreased as a percentage of general fund and slightly increased in the all funds. Um, and that's just because of the, um, we've got some capital projects included as non-departmental that again will shift as they get reallocated to the different departments um, as we move along in the budget process. The most significant changes within non-departmental, we've got an increase in tax increment payments of 1.9 million. So whenever we see an increase in um, property taxes for the general fund, we're also going to have an increase in tax increment payments. We've increased our contingency. So I mentioned 250,000 is within our executive offices for um, potential payments to um, uh, nonprofit organizations. We've added a, a contingency here about 1.75 million um, just in case our revenue um, the, the revenues that come in for, uh, are, are significantly different than what we forecasted. We want to have a little bit of a safety net for that. This is where the set aside for the mental health co-responders um, funds are that the mayor had mentioned. So that's $750,000 included um, for that. We also have $350,000 for the intercultural competence assessment evaluations for police officers. And then we have $175,000 allocated for the police officer mental health services. We did um, reduce our transfer to the capital improvement fund as well um, by about $5 million. One thing to point out is that we don't have a venue slide um, and that's because there's no venues employees in the general fund. Um, but the non-department um, transfers does include uh, transfers for venues related operations of about $5 million, which includes food gardens and the Mellon Museum. This is our citywide staffing. Um, and so our total proposed staffing is a, about 3,651 employees, which is about 12.54 employees per 1,000 residents. Um, interestingly, when you compare it to 2010, we were about 13.35 per 1,000 residents. So we spend most of our time talking about the general fund, but we did want to at least um, highlight a few of our other funds here, um, and we don't have time to go through all of them. A few items I will point out to you is on the capital improvements fund. You can see the reduction in their budget, and that's um, the primary uh, funder of this is the general fund. So with the reduction in the transfer um, from the general fund, that's, that's reflected here. Although we did, um, reduce that support by 5 million, we are still maintaining funding for renewal and replacement efforts. And so that also um, includes, still includes our contribution of a million dollars for affordable housing. We have $2.7 million in improvements and maintenance to families, parks and recreation facility. And we also have $2 million in this um, capital improvement fund for pavement rehab. A couple of other things I'll point out, solid waste has waived its fee, its, um, fee increase this year, and their program continues to review and procure um, garbage trucks to keep up with the demand and service. You'll see about midway on here, uh, unfortunately a zero here for the State Housing Initiatives Partner Program Fund um, due to the cuts um, at the state level. I'll point out right below there in the stormwater funds, there's no um, proposed rate increase for stormwater. And another item I will highlight is the water reclamation capital funds. They have a large um, $80 million proposed project for concert one improvements. 
Um, there is a potential for debt issuance for the Water Reclamation Fund, but we'll come back to you um, sometime next year uh, for that, if that's necessary. The Water Reclamation Fund has also proposed a 5% rate increase, excluding multifamily housing. And they have estimated the average impact to the customer for that rate increase is just over $2 a month. This is our total capital improvement program by by fund, and so I've touched on uh, most of these programs here, so you can see the uh, reduction in the capital improvement fund that we've talked about, and the, um, the, the significant increase in the water reclamation capital projects fund due to Conserve One. And this just breaks out that same capital, capital program by function. So next steps, um, we have a tentatively balanced budget of just over 1.4 billion. We are here today uh, in the budget workshop. Later on today on the agenda is a vote for the resolution to set the tentative millage rate. Um, commissioners will have your um, the budget and brief will be available to the public in about a week. Commissioners will have your notebooks um, distributed about the same time. We have uh, briefings scheduled in August, and then we'll come back to this council in September for the first and second public hearing and ultimate adoption of the budget. That concludes my presentation. And I will go ahead and in the slideshow, and Chris and I can take any questions. Okay, thank you, Michelle. I know that was a lot of information um, gone through in about an hour or so. Commissioners, I see Commissioner Stewart. Thank you, Mayor. And Michelle and Chris, thank you. What a great presentation. I appreciate that. Um, I got some questions going through, uh, and I've got a lot of small questions, and we'll go through the budget book. But I want to kind of just work through a couple of two or three things. And they really kind of are over trying to be looking from a 30,000 foot view. Um, Michelle, if you go back, uh, just working backwards to the front, if you'll go back to slide um, 60. And you've got uh, the expenditures of other non general fund expenditures, is it ends up being half of the recommended. Remind me again of what that the other non-general fund expenditures are. So that is um, that particular slide is really just a small selection of certain funds that we want to highlight to you. The all um, other that doesn't include um, parking. Uh, CRA, um, there's a lot of different funds that aren't included on there. Basically, it's all the other funds. Um, and so we'll have a detail of all of those within the budget and brief document that will ultimately come to you. Good, good. Um, on slide uh, 58, we're, uh, you said 12.54 uh, staff per thousand residents. Uh, that's total staff, I think, including police and fire, correct? Yes, sir. And tell me, do you know how we rank uh, in terms of other cities, either our size or in the cities around the community? Have we done any kind of ranking to that? I'm not aware that we've looked at that. Um, but that's certainly something um, we could look into. Yeah, I'm Commissioner. Sure. We we did a Pier City review a few years back. It's been some time now, so I think it's probably a good time to take a look at those numbers again. At the time when we did that Pier City review, we were pretty lean, especially for a city that has as many functions as we have on a um, employees per thousand population. We were in pretty good shape, pretty lean compared to some of our Pier Cities at that time, but we'll take a, a fresh look at it. And if you go back historically, Commissioner, I know at one point we were 15, 16, employees per thousand. So we've come down 
fairly significantly in the last 10 years. Yeah. If you go back and look at the police, I'm, I'm more interested in the number of police we have per citizen specifically and number of firefighters per citizen as it compares to other, because I think public safety is that, that key area. But I think this, this would give us indication of that at least. Um, and then the last thing really is, I mean, I've got a lot of small questions that we'll go through in our briefing, but the last thing is when we look at the CARES Act, I think a lot of things we haven't included because we don't know how that money is going to come in or come through us. But um, when I go back and look as an example, I'm looking at slides seven and eight and commitments that we've made um, and payroll costs that we've incurred. That, is that stuff coming to us through the county? Is it coming to us through the feds? Is some coming from some, some coming from the other? Chris, how does that, how is that coming to us and how will it affect this, this budget? Yeah, that's a great question, Commissioner. Um, some of it is coming to us directly. Uh, some of the uh, federal legislation that was passed um, based on the formulas and the way the money was distributed, some of it um, specifically came to the city of Orlando. Some of it we had to apply for, but it was carved out. It was almost like, you know, the money's yours, you just have to submit an application. And so a couple of these grants that are on slide nine came to us directly. Um, the Coronavirus Grant Award of almost 540000 CARES Act Provider Relief Fund Grant of 103000 and the Assistance to firefighters, those came to us directly. Um, the FEMA costs would be eligible. We would, we would apply for that through the state, um, tapping into federal money. So that would be, uh, if we, if we have, if we have expenses left over that haven't been covered with the other sources, we'll go the FEMA route. Um, FEMA is a complicated process and it's, again, it's only covering 75% of eligible costs. So to the extent we can get hundred percent funded because it fits in with, for example, Orange County's CARES Act, um, uh, guidelines, then we're certainly going to try to get 100% covered for our COVID-related expenses. But as a sort of a, a stop loss uh, or a stop gap, we have the ability to go uh, to FEMA to cover anything that we haven't covered 100% through other sources. Yeah. Um, I've heard a lot um, of chatter on um, uh, Google and Facebook about business interruption insurance. Um, I, I think we're set, essentially self-insured. But is there any CARES money that's available to us in terms of the venues, especially that will help offset some of those costs because of business, business interruption? You know, so far, um, most of what's been passed has specifically excluded uh, revenue recovery. So a lot of these laws have said, here's some money, use it to respond to the community needs. Um, but there are a lot of... Um, carve outs to say the governments can't replace revenue. So the National League of Cities, the Florida League of Cities, Florida Association of Counties and others have been lobbying um, for changes to those laws to allow uh, cities and counties and local governments to replace some lost revenue. So we're going to continue to, to watch that. Um, I hope that's the case um, um, because, you know, it would be nice to, to be able to do that. Um, but for right now, most of the funding is geared towards covering direct expenses, PPE, overtime for first responders, um, community-focused uh, programs like business assistance grants. Um, you know, the county's doing a lot of this with their $243 million of CARES Act funding. So that's just the way the, 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 the first several rounds of legislation have been written. Um, we're continuing to watch and make sure that uh, if there's opportunities to lobby um, Congress to get them to consider uh, including revenue replacement or revenue recovery, um, I think that would be uh, excellent, not just for the city of Orlando, but for Orange County, the state of Florida, all the cities and counties that are struggling to respond to uh, the pandemic. That's a good, you brought up a good point. $243 million going to the county for county residents. Um, when that gets split up, uh, if that were sales tax coming in, we get 22, 23% of the sales tax uh, that generated by the county. Um, and uh, I understand your projections and I think I tend to agree with them. Deep down inside, I'd like to get 22 or 23 percent of the 243 million. Uh, at least have some assurances that our citizens got that. Are we doing anything to track that with CARES? Um, because I'm more concerned that, I mean, if if, if the county's given away a thousand dollars in recovery, and they, I know they've had a lot of issues with that, they've done some other stuff with businesses. Um, are we tracking how how our citizens are getting that or? Um, 
because if, if it's not, then let's bring it into the budget. Let's try and, 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 and do it directly. Yeah, you know, we're still early on in that process. The county um, is in the in the process of reviewing both the small business grant applications, the individual and family assistance, the support to nonprofits, uh, all of those buckets. Um, the county is, is heavy into this work right now. Um, so we don't have any reporting. As far as I know, we don't have reporting on where that money's been dispersed yet in terms of, you know, uh, city resident versus unincorporated county resident. But all of those county programs are available countywide to city residents, unincorporated county residents, city businesses, unincorporated county businesses, everything that the county's doing right now with their CARES Act funding uh, is open to um, city businesses and city residents, just like any other uh, countywide resident. And to my knowledge, they haven't prioritized non-city residents over unincorporated areas. It's right. playing out evenly. Yeah, and, I just, and I'm just trying to figure out to make sure that we're, we're getting a fair choice. Um, the last thing is, and I'll and I'll shut up. Uh, I guess probably two things really. The communications tax. I know that that um, we've got a reduction of that. I know there's been a lot of discussion in um, legislature to uh, completely abandon it if, effectively. Um, 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 what? Tell me a little bit about. It. Do, do you think that budget estimate is too high, too low? Um, uh Sure. That so that revenue line, we've actually seen that decline for many years now, and it's not so much um, due to state changes. It's it's changing. It's changes in the way that um, people consume communication services. Uh, you know, people dropping their landline, for example, in favor of a cell phone, cheaper cell phone plans, um, streaming services, Netflix and Hulu and things like that, uh, all drive this communication services tax revenue. So things have changed a lot in that space over the last 10 years. And, you know, with price competition and other providers coming into the market, the pricing of those services has fallen. And since this communication services tax is based on the cost of the service, we've seen declines anyway. So we've already been seeing declines and projecting declines. I don't know of anything immediately on the horizon that's going to have a significant drop in that. Uh, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, that that revenue only generates about you know fourteen million dollars out of a five hundred and thirty million dollar general fund budget or so. So we don't rely on it all that heavily, but um, you know we rely on every individual revenue stream, as you know. I mean, it all adds up to try to cover the cost of municipal services. So um, that's something that's on um, the as you know, it's on the League of Cities. Uh, um, legislative watch list. I mean, it comes up every year. I think last year, the year before the state um, changed their, the state communication services tax rate, but they left the local government one um, unchanged. So, but it always ends up on, on talking points as a potential thing that they're looking at. So we're also going to be looking at it and continuing to work with our um, you know state lobbyists to, to protect that revenue stream. Because again, we rely on every little revenue stream, even if it's, you know, a 10th of a percent, it all adds up and tr to help us cover the cost uh, mm -hmm. of city services so that we don't have to fund everything with property taxes, for example. And let me, um, I know we're going to brief uh, in a couple of weeks, but uh, let me ask you, if you will, as we get together, please give me an idea of where we see 2022 and 2023. I, I just am convinced, much like the 2008, 2009, that there's going to be a longer term impact, especially on property tax. Um, you know, we get a percentage of the collections, but if people aren't paying it just by default, then um, that number goes down. We may get it in the future, uh, but that number in the taxes goes down. And I'm concerned about that as we begin to move forward. I'm also concerned about the sales tax revenue and it, it gearing back up. Um, um, so it, when we get together, let's, uh, I, I don't want us to overspend in this year and then have to come back and cut a ton of people next year because we didn't anticipate the, the revenues. And I think you've done a great job looking at the, the short term. I'd like to just talk to you more about the long term. Um, yeah. I'm Thank you, Commissioner. That's that's a great point, um, and we we are concerned about that as well. Um, as you know, fiscal year 2021, because of the the way property taxes are set at the beginning of the year, um, you know, as as we mentioned, we're not we're in pretty good shape for fiscal year 2021 to be able to cover um, the needs of our community. Fiscal 22, um, we'll be keeping a close eye on. The good thing, if there is a good thing, uh, is that we have a little bit of a, a lead time on that. So we'll watch what happens with um, home sales, property valuations between now and January 1st. Um, there's enough data out there for us to get a, a, a fairly decent sense of where um, where we think assessed values are going to go. Uh, and we'll, so we have another three or four months you know, to watch and then we'll start 
Um, probably next year we'll start planning the 22 budget a little bit early, um, just so we've got some time to um, potentially reprioritize. Because if we only have a certain amount of, of, of resources, we have to rethink the things that um, that, that might have made the cut in prior years that, that might not make the cut in future years. It's a little early to, to, to talk about that in details, but I'm glad you brought it up because it's something that we have to constantly be uh, vigilant about um, so that we're prepared for the long term, um, you know, to continue to, to, to be in financially, you know, good position. And I felt like in the last couple of years, we'd been a little bit lazy knowing that the economy was growing. We kind of catch up with it. Now, all of a sudden we know it's not going to grow. Um, and we need to kind of get back. I, I don't want to say hunker down because I don't think we're there quite there yet, but we need to make sure that we're, we're prepared to do that. I know we've done a lot with, with, um, contract labor, uh, especially in terms of, um, uh, uh, economic development. Um, and that's good news. And I think it was a good move by the mayor uh, years ago to, to, to look at those as one-year contracts. And if we can't renew them and we can't afford it, then we just aren't going to do it. Yep. Um, and I think that's a good idea. And the you know, commissioner, you, you were, you were here and many of us were here during the great recession and we had to, you know, rethink city services and, and scale back to fit, um, within our resources. It's something we have to do from time to time with recessions. So, um, you know, hopefully it's nowhere near, uh, as, as, um, as damaging as the great recession was, um, that hit us particularly hard on property taxes. Um, so, right. but we'll, we'll continue to watch. I just know that a large number of commercial rental, uh, they're backing out. They're not changing guys who are going to move into downtown decide to stay where they were just because of the nature of what happened with COVID. Um, and so that's going to have a long-term impact. And the last thing, mayor, let me ask you, if you would, um, one of the things that I think that we keep hearing from, the, 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 so the, the defund the police and the protesters is how we're spending our money. And I think that, that uh, if we can get some kind of analysis of the types of jobs that are, are we're doing, um, uh, jobs that, that um, uh, and working directly with social service agencies, uh, that kind of funding, the, the jobs in terms of um, uh, health and mental health, um, I don't think it's good enough just to say we've got police. I think we've got to go inside that police number and say, this is what patrol is doing. And this is what we're doing in terms of, of support to, um, uh, you know, Harbor house to, to whatever mental health can be. And so maybe I'm thinking of just looking at kind of the types of jobs that we have so we can get a better understanding to, to, to tell the public about kind of what we do, not necessarily just the title that we use. I think we always have to be mindful that we need to continuously educate the public on how we're spending their tax dollars because um, a, a good example is what we spent on affordable housing. We've right. done more probably than any local government in the state of Florida. And yet when you talk to people, you know, they criticize what we've not done in terms of working for, towards affordable housing. So point well taken. And they don't, um, they don't, look at the state as a part of the solution, which is we see the state as a great way to leverage. Um, they don't help. <laughs> um, we, we, see, we see the state as trying to help, and then the state backs out on that money and then kind of tries to stick some more money back in. So it's been a, uncomfortable uh, for us to be able to educate that. Anyway, thank you very much, Mayor. Thank you for the, your presentation, and I'm looking forward to meeting and going through some of the details with our staff. Thank you very much. I see that Commissioner Sheehan and Commissioner Hill have their hands raised virtually. So Commissioner Sheehan and then Commissioner Hill. Thank you, Mayor. And pardon my dog. Apparently someone just decided to ring the doorbell and she's freaking out a little bit. So if you hear my doggy in the background, I am working virtually. So <laughs> I apologize for Sienna in advance. Um, I had a question about, you know, something that I've been hearing from uh, business owners since this uh, downturn. Um, one thing that we do, the one thing that, excuse me, my neighbor is outside freaking out. <laughs> can y'all let Commissioner Hill go first and I can deal with this? I'm so sorry. <laughs> Commissioner Hill, would you mind going? Okay. You hit mute, Commissioner. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Chris and... Uh, Michelle, thank you so very much. That was quite, you always do an uh, excellent job with uh, our budget and all your diligence. And thank your team also, because I know it's a team effort. 
but there are some things I did want to cover. I'm going to start first with uh, uh, page 25, slide 25. I just have one question on that. And it's part of the general fund uh, housing uh, budget. Uh, I know uh, last year, uh, due to uh, uh, Tallahassee, wasn't able to get monies for our rehab uh uh, projects there in housing. Is there going to be funds available? Because there's so many people needing uh, different housing uh, issues resolved through our rehab program. And I know that's been halted. Do we see any funds available this year? Michelle, you want to you jump in? Uh, sure. Okay. Yep. Yeah, you know, this the across the board, we were um, really looking forward to the, the great things we were going to be able to do with state funding for housing. Um, and that funding got vetoed um, by the governor. So, you know, our housing department continues to look at what's available and to prioritize the activities in that space. Um, it's going to be significantly different than what than it would have been had um, the governor not needed to veto. And again, he, he did that to balance the budget going into, uh, you know, unexpected times due to the pandemic. So, I, you know, I am probably of all the people on this meeting right now, I'm the least knowledgeable about all of the details on the housing front, but we do have the briefings with you, Commissioner, set up that we can go through in more detail. Michelle and I will touch base with, uh, you know, Oren. We'll talk with Kevin and Deborah uh, in the CEO's office and make sure we can give you a little more information. So I apologize, I don't have uh, details on, on what the work plan is going to look like right now. I'm sure if Oren was here, he'd be able to jump in, but we'll, we'll get that covered in your, in your briefings if that's okay. Thank you. And now the, the, the last piece when it comes to housing, as the mayor stated, I, I think we lead, we lead the state, uh, if not central Florida, in uh, creating a more affordable housing and permanent support of housing. Uh, and also uh, for the very, very low income, I think we even have a, three projects on the horizon right now that has been fully funded. And that is the second phase of Paramore Oaks. I uh, didn't see that there that we need to count uh, where all of those uh, units, I think a hundred plus units will be for those uh, that are 40 and 30% of the average medium income. And that gap was something that we've had a very hard time trying to fill for those that are very low income. And now with COVID, there's going to be even a greater need for that percentile. So uh, thank you with that. And even the Mercy Drive project, our Fairlawn Greens, is also going to meet those needs uh, moving forward in 2001 for very low income. And those apartments there are quality, very quality, uh, 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 quality development developers, and those are going to be for very low income. So I'm, I'm just excited to see that. But I know there's some taxpayers uh, a residential that uh, homes are in such disrepair. And I know that, so if we can kind of address that. Now the CRA, uh, and I'm so thankful for uh, last uh, Monday or so when council approved the $6,000 rent abatement for uh, the minority businesses, primarily in Paramore. Uh, something I've been speaking about here for the city uh, invested properties. Uh, and those that were were uh, uh, up to their rent, I uh, know that's not the proper word, but as of May 26, was current on their rents. And now uh, we're finding that Friday, uh, many people, uh, unemployment is going to be lost, even from the uh, national level. So next week is going to be, a uh, week after next, is going to be some terrible times already that's been in front of us. So uh, if we can take a look at that, at the city-owned projects that we've invested the $40 million in, uh, it will be a travesty that here we uh, gave people quality, affordable housing, safe housing, and told them they have a home and because of COVID for them to be removed if they were current. So uh, I don't want developers being able to be able to start eviction on the $40 million that we have created for them to make almost a billion dollars on there in council. So I do think we need to pay close attention to that. In the meanwhile, find out, similar to something Commissioner uh, Stewart spoke about with the venues, 
uh, um, to see if they got any CARES monies. And if they did get any CARES monies, how are they utilizing those CARES monies uh, uh, to offset whatever gap we need to fill? So I'm concerned about that. And I'm going to, uh, since I touched that, if we can also, I, I, I did look somewhere in the um, Washington Post where many of our venue partners, you know, Orlando City Soccer is an entity in themselves, but Orlando Magic and Florida Citrus Sports got multiple millions of dollars. I saw it. And I want to know, since they are in our venue, and if we have to take a loss, are they going to use the $5 million that Florida Citrus got to help with the cost of Camping World Stadium? And is the $15 million that Orlando, uh, and I might be a little, a million or two off, but what's a million if you're talking about fifteen? <laughs> no, I joke. It, it's a lot of money. Um, what are they going to do with compensating uh, the venue since they're housed there? And if any of that money can uh, be used uh, with our partnership. So I don't know those questions. I just saw what was dispensed to our partners that live in our house. And usually, like any good parent, if you're working, well, this is the way they do it in Paramore when I was growing up. If you was working, you pay a bill. So since it's, they're in our house, are they going to help us with some of our laws? And that uh, that's it with, with that one. Uh, Bell, just I don't know specifically, but I assume, and I'm not aware of them receiving it, but I assume it's PPP money, okay. which means they had to pay their employees and retain their employees through a certain date. And then um, I will say that the magic, even though it's arguably whether they had to or not, went ahead and paid us okay. for use of the Amway for the dates that they didn't play the last 11 games, I think it was. So they did make a contribution in that. Thank manner. you, sir. Well, that's that's fair. And I appreciate them. They've, they've been great partners. I've been working with them through COVID. We just had about 500 uh, residents throughout Orlando and primarily in Paramore walk up and drive through there with COVID-19 uh, testing. So I do want to say they've been great partners. I just want to follow the money and see what, what we've gotten. So sure. both uh, Steve Hogan and Florida Citrus Sports have been great partners during COVID over at in the west side of Orlando with uh, the food disparities and many of the things that's going on over there with families and especially uh, live for Orlando uh, they're at Pandanas in the West Side. So I don't want to uh, uh, make it seem as if they're not being great uh, community stakeholders. And they have been great partners to this office and to this city, especially uh, during COVID. Uh, I just wanted to understand more about uh, the funding uh, mm -hmm. that was received. Um, so so um, I'm going to move to um, page 24. And that is also under the general division um, excuse me, I apologize. Yeah. Yes, it is. Uh, under the new uh, funding year 2021 recommended programming, uh, the 475,000 uh, for at which I'm in agreement uh, for these project managers, Spanish translator, public record specialist, especially in times such as this our public records and clerk office really probably need more funding because everything's now being utilized with them through the new era of Zoom uh, and virtual meetings. And I'm glad to see a labor new uh, equity official come on. And uh, that's going to be amazing. Thank you, Mayor, for your leadership in that and putting funding in place. But th there was one thing I think I would hope that we add another person, Mayor, uh, uh, Spanish is becoming a primary language, but we forgot the Creole uh, community. And and many uh, folks there on the west side of Orlando in District 5 and District 6, their children speak great English, but their uh, mothers and grandparents uh, are having a hard time. So if we can add a, 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 a person that speaks Spanish and Creole in that position so we don't leave out any demographic, that will be great. Um, so, uh, Commissioner, on that point, um, we have increased our um, contractual funding for translation services. 
Okay. So while it's not a position, we do have funds within the budget. For I like the position. I like a dedicated position. If we're going to put a dedicated position for a Spanish speaking uh, translator, I would hope that we have a dedicated position for when Creole uh, uh, residents and constituents call in. If we're going to be multicultural and all inclusive. I would hope. I mean, that's not, I know we got time. This is just a rough draft, but mm -hmm. I'm just leaving some thoughts here today. I know we're not voting. I'm just leaving thoughts and we'll talk more about it, but it has to be said. Um, so then I will go down to uh, page 24 and it's all going to go hand in hand with um, my brother's keeper. Uh, the recommended programming for, uh, I think it's the uh, parks and recs and all those services and OPD. I am not against um, first, let me talk about M uh, MBK. MBK uh, it was one of the uh, things that Mayor Dyer, when I first arrived in 2014, Mayor that you championed uh, with President Barack Obama and you've done a great job with championing that. But Mayor, uh, since 2014, we have not had a budget, Mayor. And we have been working from, you know, the seat of our pants. And especially in this new climate and your dedication and leadership as me and you go throughout the country and I always talk about my brother's keeper, there needs to be some funding put in place for my brother's keeper. Just give you a little information why my brother's keeper is so important. If you guys will allow me uh, briefly to read this. The city launched my brother's keeper in Orlando in 2014. And myself and Chief Rolone, when he was the deputy chief, I do want to add this uh, caveat, traveled throughout uh, the nation, learning about 21st century policing under the My Brother's Keep Rules model. Myself and whom he now has tasked uh, to be part of uh, the Help Spearhead, I think his community uh, engagement piece there on the west side of Orlando and maybe the east side is, uh, um, Lieutenant, I, I'm not certain if uh, Lieutenant is a, a Lieutenant or not, but uh, Joseph Lundy, and I apologize if I didn't get his rank uh, proper. And, and, and both of them has done a good job. Um, um, we have gone seeking practices, but in fairness, I, I, I do want to read this and then I'll move forward. The city launched My Brother's Keeper, Orlando 2014. Since then, uh, FPR applied for grant funding several times. We only received a small amount uh, that has been leveraged. Never enough to pay for part of the cost of the city's My Brother Keeper's coordinator position, but I would say, Mayor and Council, um, 2020, we did receive $50,000 from uh, MPK, um, and we were able to uh, uh, get a coordinator. Uh, well, we pulled one from After School All-Stars and put him there. Um, my brother Keepers Orlando goals are to improve academic performance, increase employment, reduce incarceration, among other Orlando boys of young men in color. Data demonstrates persistent disparities between Orlando black and white youth and academic achievement, which the mayor spoke about earlier with PKZ, but this is different. This target 16 to 29. PKZ uh, uh, expansion targets uh, from uh, incubator uh, to career usually stop about at 21. And it's a, a whole different program. With regard to the latter, the Florida Department of Juvenile Justice defines racial equity ethnic disparities as the unequal treatment are disproportionately punitive responses compared to other similarly uh, situated races and ethnicities. Data for all of Florida counties, included Orange County, is illustrated. And I have an attachment in one, but this is what's so important. In 2019, 9,032 total arrests by OPD, that's 2019. And this is not a condemnation of OPD. And I'll, I, I'm giving you the stats why I think my brother keepers is so important. 
by OPD. Uh, total arrests, 5,233, 58% were black people. The most frequent reason accounting for 27% of the arrests of black people was miscellaneous, defined as criminal traffic violations, which I know Mayor Dyer and the team is addressing and, and, and Chief Malone, violations of both city and county ordinances, arrests for failure to appear and violations of probation, something I know uh, the city uh, nor OPD can do anything about. But my brother's keeper works with our uh, reform uh, component over at the courthouse. The second most frequent reason was drugs. Drugs equipment accounting for 23% of the arrest black people in Orlando. So the reason I'm saying these things, Mayor, is that I am in agreement with more community policing. Hiring more, 10 more officers, maybe five. Uh, I recognize the budget that we're, uh, the grant that we're doing today at councils, one point, and then the two million that OPD is going to match. But that two million is actually two million that we're giving from this budget, with zero being given from my brother's keeper. OPD needs to do, and hopefully uh, can do more better community policing. But well, putting more police in the community isn't an answer to community policing. Commissioner, I mean, uh, uh, Chief Malone can agree with this because he went out with me throughout the country several times and is led by the city's recreation and other city programs and grassroots. Police, police. We do need them to be community servants in the communities, but we don't need them to create mental health programs or tell us who our mental health consultants are going to be. Sure, they need mental health. So everything right now is going to the police. There's nothing addressed outside of PKZ for boys of color in these urban cores with trauma. Uh, I still haven't seen anything on here about my blueprint program, your blueprint program, our blueprint program to train these individuals when they go out there and find that they're uneducated, jobless, skillless, and how we're going to get them into that positive direction. Um, I don't see uh, uh, where we have dedicated funding to, to the uh, 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 health and wellness of these indigenous communities. So I don't think that OPD should lead community police, Mayor. I think some of that funding needs to go back to where you started my brother's keeper, so that they can continue to march forward with the orders that you had given them and which we already have a model for. And, and this is no disrespect to uh, uh, Chief Rallone, and I've told him this, that the, 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 the model that he brought back is his model. No one was included but police officers that went out and studied this model. Lisa Early was not included. I wasn't included. Tyler Rodney, Brenda March, nobody was included. So he comes back with a model from the police and tell us this is what we're going to implement. I say, no, sir. I say this needs to be a community process led by community leaders. There's no funding for grassroots organizations to help in that cause, only our acts. He said, we need volunteers. Well, let, let me tell you something. Even volunteers need funding to do the work. Even nonprofits need funding to do the work. There's nothing put in place there. It's only about retraining police officers, giving them mental health, uh, uh, having them go out in the community and talk with people. Well, these same demographics need those same things that we're saying we're going to give to them. So I hope we reconsider some of this funding. I'm not saying to fund the police. I said that constantly. I'm saying fund these programs as we move forward with funding the police for the training and de-escalation. So we can't build them up and still have not addressed the real problems while we're having these problems. So with that, Mayor, that's that's uh, what I request and I ask. I look forward to working with staff and accounting to make sure 
that this time around we get it right. I look forward to working with Chief Rolone on this. This should not be police driven. I respect them, but I know this has to be led by the community. And all the models that we went through throughout America said that the community has to lead this. And that's why someone like Lisa Early and my brother's keeper need to be at the forefront of this and needs to be funded, sir. And the blueprint program. Okay. And Commissioner, we do have money in for the training programs. Thank you. I'll have to look at my brother's keeper, but I agree with you on the importance of that. And then in, I think you were referring to the co-response program, but I'm not 100% sure. But we haven't developed exactly what that's going to look like. But certainly we will take input from everybody related to that. Yes. Mr. Sheehan. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you for bearing with me. My elderly neighbor is so used to me being home when she needs help that she was laying on the doorbell. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Um, on, my, on my questioning, the business tax receipts is something that I've heard from businesses who've been closed that they might have a difficulty paying. So I don't know if there's any way to allow them to have some grace period on that because a lot of them have been closed, haven't been able to, you know, to have any revenue coming in. So that bill coming due, especially for nightclubs and bars and things like that along the Mills 50 area I've heard from, uh, you know, that might be helpful to them. Um, on the venue, some of the other commissioners hit on this, but um, it would be helpful to know what, if they're going to need help with operating expenses, what that is going to look like. I know they've still had to keep the lights on. They still had to keep the air conditioning going and they still have net revenue coming in. So I'm very concerned about how that's going to impact Amway, Dr. Phillips, you know, um, any of our facilities in terms of venues. Um, I know we've had some uh, several employees, you know, testing positive for COVID, um, and that we've had to make uh, we've had to cover those positions. I know, especially in police, fire, and solid waste. Um, what I'm interested in seeing is how we can how we've covered those positions and how we can, you know, maybe recap some of that revenue if we need to. Um, I've also heard from a lot of the community organizations, they are concerned about not-for-profit not support. So I'm glad to see that we are making a commitment to make sure we can still assist them because they need that help more now than ever. Um, many organizations that do really great work haven't been able to have the usual fundraisers. They haven't been able to do any of the things they usually do because they usually have galas. They have, you know, um, events and they have simply have not been able to do those. So I'm glad to see that we're helping with community contingency dollars. Um, I like seeing that we're doing the use of forest investigators. I think that's really important. Although I have talked to the chief this, this week, we've talked about diversity in the, in the police department in terms of racial makeup. But honestly, I think that if we have more women in positions of authority at the police department, that will help with use of force as well because women tend to de-escalate things. It's just part of our charm. So I think that's really important as we're looking at police officers that we also look not just to promote based on um, on uh, nationality or, or origin. I think we also need to look at gender. Um, I like that we're um, adding some additional crossing guards. That's really important. I'm hearing from the community that's important. Um, and I would be remiss to say that, you know, that my district is always concerned about brick street repair. Um, unfortunately, um, streets has concentrated on the roads less traveled and they have not done the repairs that are necessary. So I don't know how to allocate that money to make it clear. We don't want them fixing Ruth Lane and, you know, easy streets. I say we are, they're, fixing the, they're fixing the roads less traveled and not getting to the roads that really, really need it like Livingston. So I don't know how you know, they say that they don't have the money to fix the streets. We get them the money to fix the streets and then they fix the back alleys. It's very frustrating to me that I've got Ruth Lane fixed, but a, but a street over, I've got Livingston with huge potholes that's very much traveled. And yet I get an alley fix without getting a street fixed. I think we need to figure out a way, um, you know, if we're going to, if they if they say they don't have resources, we get resources allocated. They need to make sure they're using them on the streets that really need the repairs. Um, and one thing that I'd like to add um, on affordable housing is not only did the governor strip ship, um, they also have not 
made us whole on Sadowski affordable housing. And a lot of people don't understand what that is. Everywhere in the state where they sell a house, and this is supported by the realtors, there is something, it's called doc stamps, and that money is supposed to go to affordable housing. It's supposed to be a trust fund. Every year, the Florida legislature raids that. It's been billions and billions of dollars that has supposed to come back to local communities, and it didn't come back again. Not only did they raid Sadowski, they took the little bit of ship funding that they've you know, allocated to us. So I think we need to start talking about the really important issues of affordable housing and how the realtors have supported the Sadowski Fund, put it in place. It's kind of like the TDT where the hotel industry pays a certain amount of tax increment and everything. And then that gets used for, for you know, we, they've been very kind to use it for venues, but that's used for promoting the promoting tourism. The same thing the realtors did for affordable housing with Sadowski. And the real and the and the legislature raids it year after year after year. And unfortunately, our local delegation, I understand that they're in a minority, but they need to be talking about how the impacts this has. Billions of dollars in our state that could have gone for building affordable housing. So I think that, you know, while we're concentrating on the little bitty portions and saying, well, we need to cut to pay for this, there's dollars available for affordable housing that the state legislature strips out every year. The realtors who pay it want it to come back to our communities. And I think it's it's almost criminal what they're doing in terms of rating the trust funds. They also rate the trust, trust funds for um uh, for, you know, Florida forever and everything like that is disgraceful. But I think that's something that we really need as, as local elected officials, we need to talk about that every time we talk about our budget, because this does impact our budget. Commissioner Hill's shaking her head. Yes, this does impact us very significantly. And rather than constantly relying upon local government to do this, why can't we just get the dollars that we should be entitled to to do some of these programs that are very, very important? But I just want to commend the staff, Chris, Michelle, y'all did a wonderful job of going over the entire budget. Um, you know, I'm, I, it's my job to fuss about what we aren't doing, but y'all have done a great job, um, you know, and I, I really like the way that you've done the format and explain that, but I would like to, and, and I also like what you've also talked about, the impacts of the tax cuts, um, you know, the, the revenues that we would have available if not for Save Our Homes, and I don't think Save Our Homes has had the biggest impact as commercial properties and the amount of revenue that's not coming back to our city, but yet commercial properties use a disproportionate amount of our services, and I think that's an important thing to really talk about, so thank you for including that. We have done more with less. But I'm just asking for us to get our fair share in terms of some of the other things, especially since there's this community uh, driven desire for, you know, for more assistance. And we've we've done what we can to try to do that. But um, but there needs to be more that we need to we need to have assistance and partnership from the federal and state government, have them stop, you know, rating these funds that should be coming back to local government as well. It can't just come back on us all the time. So thank you for this very informative um presentation today and I appreciate you and thank you council for bearing with me uh, with my neighbor appreciate you thank you thank you Commissioner Sheehan Commissioner Gray thank you mayor a couple quick questions um either Michelle or Chris um pay uh chart 32 page 32 general fund revenues just wanted to confirm I think Michelle what I heard you say is of the property tax increase we anticipate Roughly 40% from growth, 60% from increased property values. Is that fair? Yeah, that's that's pretty close. Okay, okay. And again, I guess I would echo a little bit of Commissioner Stewart's comments. I think we need to be careful with that as we enter, because nobody knows what's going to go on with the economy, but that, because without that increase, um, it kind of busts our general fund budget because that's a pretty huge increase. So um, we'll talk a little more about that. Um, I'm over on page 42 now. Um, again, the most unpopular one, but I got to bring it up. If I, about health benefits. <clears throat> again, just for clarification, I think, Michelle, you said, typically what we see in the standard is most employees pay 7.5% and we only pass along 1%. Michelle, you're on mute. You're on mute, Michelle. <laughs> Sorry. 
I swore I wasn't going to do that too. On That's all right. <laughs> um, this chart actually um, shows the premium increases. So the it was actually to demonstrate how we've seen uh, much lower premium increases as compared to um, the industry average. Okay. Not what we pass on to employees, but more Correct. what we've encountered ourselves. Correct. It, it's really a, a demonstration of our, um, of HR's uh, management of our, yeah, of our healthcare makes, costs. Makes perfect sense. I could say oh. just a, in a slightly different way. Since we are self-insured, we have the ability to structure our plan in a way that, that, that provides the care that our, that our employees need, um, but does it in a way that um, minimizes any non-essential costs, for lack of a better word. And so when we look at what the healthcare industry overall is doing, and we see these you know, large increases every year because of the way the HR team manages the structure of the plan, um, along with wellness incentives, and, and, and there's, there, there's a whole slew of things that go into controlling these costs. This slide just shows that they've just really done an incredible job versus if we had been um, you know, fully insured with a, with a private uh, healthcare provider um, where we would have expected to see um, the, the the larger trends that you see on the chart. So we've done a, a I think, a, I think the HR team has done a fantastic job of controlling costs. Yeah, no doubt about that. And I think, but across the board, we've seen healthcare costs come down, right? Nobody's doing elective surgeries, et cetera, during COVID. So I, I think our healthcare partners would tell us that, that things are, are not good in that world right now. Um, page 53 I guess uh, I'm looking at the SRO, school resource officers. We're adding some. I guess that means that we have not been able, and I'm kind of looking at the mayor, to come to terms with the school board about SROs. Because, again, I think this is a plus or minus $8 million item. Fair or unfair? Uh, I would say in terms of paying for them, that's fair. What we are having in discussion or want to have a discussion with them about is what the role of school resource officers ought to be mm -hmm. when there's an unruly child in a classroom that the first person a teacher calls should not be the SRO. It ought to be the principal or the guidance counselor or something like that. So we're trying to work on what their responsibilities are in terms of the cost of them though. We, Orlando, I see you're, you're on. Do you want to speak to whatever discussions are ongoing with the county? School yes, Mayor. Commissioner, we they typically cover up to $50,000 of the officer's salary. Um, right. We have asked in the past that they would consider one day having their own police department, but that's not in the works at this time. But anything that will minimize our interaction with our youth in a negative situation, obviously, is what we're looking for moving forward. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Um, Commissioner, just one last thought on that. I'll, yeah. I'll remind you that the state a couple of years ago mandated that we have school resource right. officers in all the schools, but they provided no funding for that. Yeah. I just kind of remember a year ago it was dropped in our lap. We really didn't have a choice, but I think we all decided we would try to work out an arrangement with a little bit better cost sharing concept. And look, I know there's a lot of things that have happened over the last 12 months. So um, my final thing is on uh, charts 55, 56. Um, it just feels to me as just a general policy, if we're growing as a city, uh, people demand more services. Uh, I'm, I'm a little surprised that we're not adding more horsepower to both public works and transportation. Maybe I'm misunderstanding that, but it just speaks to our level of service. And I, I don't know how we have this kind of growth and we're not adding more folks and more resources to both public works and transportation. Obviously, in my district, that growth is a big issue, but um, those are the two areas I deal with most, um, and, and I know those folks are always struggling to stay up. They seem to be more reactive than proactive, so I'd like to challenge us if we could look at that a little bit. Um, I don't know all the, the details of their budget, obviously, at this point, but um, a little surprised that we don't have more resources going in those two areas, so I, I'd ask us to kind of take a closer look. Okay. Sure. When we have our briefings with you, we can bring you more information. But um, 55 and 56, this is all general fund focus. Right. So the public work side and the transportation um, side, those are just positions and, and their budget funded by um, the general fund. But we can provide some more details on the hall funds. Um, 
project okay. site plan. Okay. So if you go back to the all funds page. I don't remember what it is. Public works is actually the highest percentage of any department. Mm -hmm. That's right. Capital intensive. Right. Person or personnel intensive. Fair enough. And I'm going to, I'm going to step out on a limb and I know I'll probably make commissioner Hill mad, but um, I'm sorry in, in advance, but um, one of the great things I think we all realized last month or last council is when we speak our mind, things get done, but it, not a, a condemnation of my brother's keeper or anything else, but it's always been my position that we as the government should help fund and kickstart good, good, worthy uh, social programs, no doubt. But after a while, it feels to me like whether it's the arts, whether it's it's a social program, over time, those organizations show the benefit and the value. And it feels to me like private funding should take a bigger portion going forward as opposed to public funding. We've got to prime the pump, kickstart it, get it going. But after we demonstrate that it's effective, it feels to me like the private sector will support it and should put more money into it. And so I don't know what it is about my brother's keeper. I'm not that familiar with it. So, so it's so, not, a, it's, so it's not a combination of that. I'm just saying it goes for the arts too. And I've said this about like some of the arts groups over time, you have to convince your constituency that yes, it's effective. And then you go to the private sector and say, look what we're doing, help fund it. And, and that's how we do it. So that's just a so comment. Just for clarity, I, I agree with you, uh, Commissioner Gray. So yep. you didn't upset me. And that's why I'm asking the mayor and council today. As of 2014, the city of Orlando has not sponsored my brother's keeper. We have been around the state and around the nation talking about we are a partner and we haven't shown ourselves partner like. So now's the time in 2021 to spoundly put a stake in the ground with my brother's keeper and fund it. We have gone out to other entities and other private donors to fund this, but we have not gotten any funding from the city of Orlando that's championed this. So, okay. so that's where we're at. Fair enough. Thank Thanks. You. Thank you, Mayor. That's all I've got. All right. Mr. Burns. Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor and, and Commissioner. I'd like to say thank you to uh, Chris and Michelle for the uh, thorough presentation. Uh, just a you know, few things. This is my first budget workshop, so uh, thank you for for uh, the details. Uh, and I just wanted to mention that uh, I I think that this budget does show that we are headed in in the right direction when we talk about the co-responders, uh, co-responding teams uh, that was mentioned. Uh, so I look forward to the additional discussions of exactly how that looks, how, how does that uh, work. But also, I'm, I'm hoping that we'll make some intentional investments uh, around the affordable and attainable housing that may not necessarily come directly from the feds through the CDBG uh, program, because I know that can be, be limited. Um, and also, you know, I, I, I support what Commissioner Hill mentioned about the uh, investments that are needed into uh, what I call kind of the community support programs uh, like mentoring, job readiness, and things of that nature. So I just wanted to uh, say that this, you know, it's a lot of information to take, you know, to take in, but I do feel confident that uh, at least some of the discussions are happening that will uh, uh, move us in the direction of making the, the uh, appropriate investments into community building uh, and not just keeping the uh, the status quo. When we talk about these co-responding teams, uh, one of the things I'd like us to discuss is, you know, should these teams reside under uh, under the uh, uh, chief for loan in, in the police department? Are there some opportunities to uh, to expand that? Uh, so again, thank you for for all of the information. Uh, look forward to working with staff over the next few months to uh, get a better understanding, hash out some uh, some of the details that that have been presented uh, this morning. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Ortiz, I see your uh, comment in the chat room on sign language. We do that by contract. Yes, um, sir. I'll just all of our yep. events, but if you did, you have anything else? No, no, no. That that was that was it. I was just since we're talking about languages, I want to make sure that we don't forget about that because it's an intricate part of our community. Um, 
uh, I will talk to the to the commissioners uh, respectively. And I heard about some um, some of them asking about some ratios, and others talking about the different programs. So what I'm going to do is, uh, in lieu of better communication, I'm going to make appointments with them and talk to them personally. Thank okay. You. All right. Um, I want to thank Chris, all of and Michelle, all of your staff for all the hard work that they've put in over the course of the last three, four, five months. Um, a lot of detail, a lot of good information shared today. We've tried to listen to the community. I've had many, many um, meetings, virtual meetings over the course of the last 30, 45 days, and we've tried to implement some of those things. Uh, some of the things that we're going to do with the co-responder teams and some of the other things are new to us. So we don't have the plans fully developed, but we do have money allocated in the budget to be able to do th these things and to be flexible on some others. So uh, you'll get uh, as much briefings as you want during the course of August, and then we'll bring the final plan to the public for two meetings in September. So thank you, and that'll conclude our workshop.